During this period, the uh, South Africa was, of course, preparing for war. It had decided there was a, 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 a the, the government changed. Smuts came in as prime minister, and uh, he uh, uh, led the country into the war in a very, very sensible way. Because, as everybody may remember, in those years, there was always the big conflict in South Africa because between Afrikaans and English. This is a fight that was going on for donkey's years, and it was a great pity because the biggest problem that we did have was never addressed. We were always smuts, and everybody was always hoping that the English and Afrikaans people would get together so as to form one unit of white Europeans, but it never happened. Um, so uh, Smuts was very, very clever, and he made an air force and an armed, uh, armed uh, South African army consisting entirely of volunteers. We all volunteered, and we took on what was called those days the Red Tab, to distinguish us from people who were not volunteers. Well, over the period of the war, the chaps that hadn't volunteered gradually drifted out from the armed forces, and nobody worried about them eventually. Um, but to carry on with my story, I, I then uh, we then got to the stage where South Africa was prepared to actually start training pilots for the war effort. Um, it was decided by the government that all civil flying would stop, all the clubs would close down, all the club aircraft, which were Tiger Moths and uh, 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 Gypsy Moths in those days, the main training aircraft, uh, organizations in, say, Port Elizabeth, East London, Durban, Southwest Africa in those days in Wintook, all these aeroplanes at these various clubs that were training pilots in, the, in, in, uh, in terms of the pupil pilot scheme, Piro's pupil pilot scheme, were flown to Bloemfontein. And there was formed the first elementary flying training school at Bloemfontein. Uh, the, all the civil instructors were given military rank. I think they were all second lieutenants, yeah. They were all given military rank, put into uniform. As I said, all other civil flying stopped and uh, uh, we congregated as the first uh, elementary flying training school at Bloemfontein. We were under the command of a chap by the name of Colonel uh, uh, Toby Moll, who was a permanent force officer. There were also flight commanders who were all permanent Air Force officers, and the instructors, of course, were mostly civil instructors who'd become militarized, if you could put it that way. We carried on flying their uh, elementary flying training. I, I still flew some aeroplanes up to Bloemfontein because I had a civil flying license, which was more than most other chaps had. Uh, we carried on our, our uh, military training now with a military background, of course, lectures and all that sort of stuff, drilling, learning how to drill and give orders and instructions. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time there more than necessary because the rest of the Air Force wasn't ready yet to accept any further flying. In the meantime, of course, plans were made uh, at other Air Force bases in order to accommodate some more pilots in order to train them on advanced uh, stuff. Well, eventually we all qualified uh, as uh, pupil pilots, as elementary uh, pilots ready to go on to what we call service flying, service flying aeroplanes. We all moved then to uh, uh, what in those days was called Roberts Heights, outside Pretoria, today Swatkops, and we were uh, put into a military camp. Uh, we were the f only people in that camp and were the first to start this sort of stuff, uh, the, 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 the actual wartime training. So there we did a lot of more drilling have military drilling, military law, all sorts of stuff, and were converted onto service-type aircraft. I was lucky. The two service-type aircraft that you could be converted on was one as a Western Wapiti, which was a sort of uh, 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 
aircraft which the Air Force had a lot of, and the others were Hawker Hearts. The South African government, realizing what the position was, had bought a lot of old Hawker Hearts from the Royal Air Force. These Hawker Hearts were uh, originally designed in 1928 as day bombers, and uh, a lot of ours, I believe, came from India. They were redundant in the Royal Air Force. So these Hawker Hearts were, were uh, adapted for flying training. They were very primitive aeroplanes, and of course to us coming from Tiger Moths were very big brutes because here we were operating Tiger Moths at 130 horsepower motors. Now all of a sudden we are sitting in this aeroplane which has got 480 horsepower Rolls-Royce Kestrel V12 engine. was quite a shock to actually get into this. Uh, the front cockpit, instead of uh, we in Tiger Moths and Gypsies, we always sat in the back cockpit and the instructor used to sit in front. Um, you know, the flying training uh, was, was actually a wonderful, was, was, was a very excellent scheme. Uh, we were trained by all the flying, civil flying instructor had at some stage or, uh, or other attended a central flying school course. So the standard of instruction in the South Africa for flying was extremely high. And uh, most of the South African pilots, of course, benefited enormously by this. Uh, the flying training uh, uh, scheme or system eventually uh, uh, developed uh, into the Empire Training Scheme, uh, in which uh, encompassed uh, uh, all the Empire units like, uh, like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, Rhodesia, and South Africa joined as a separate unit under what they called the Joint Air Training Scheme because South Africa was always sort of on the outskirts of the empire there. Because of its history and its nature, uh, there was never a huge enthusiasm to actually become a, a very close ties with the empire. It always retained its own identity as compared to the other uh, empire countries. Anyway, we went there. We, I was fortunate and I came onto Hawker Hearts. As I said, this was a big brute and it was a very primitive aeroplane. Apart from the fact that it was big and powerful, it had no brakes and it had a tail skid. There was no, one of the most difficult things to do on a heart was to taxi it. Uh, and it's, uh, the Hawker Heart, uh, of course, uh, being a British aeroplane operating off soft fields in England, uh, the tail skid used to dig into the ground, into the soil, and therefore you could use a certain amount of throttle, get slipstream over the tails, uh, the, the, the rudder, and in that way you could actually manage to steer it on the ground. But when you started operating at, 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 at uh, Roberts Heights, where there was a huge tarmac area, all the aeroplanes in the morning used to be lined up. We used to be brought to the airfield by bus we used to line up in front of the uh, control tower and first had morning prayers. And then we'd go off and do our various flights and uh, we'd uh, then be authorized. Every flight, of course, is authorized in the military with, a, with instructions as what we have to do. And uh, we were converted onto these Hawker Hearts by instruction. I had two instructors who never took the oath. They, they were two Afrikaans fellows, one chap's name was Dracht and the other chap's name was Geldenhuis. And uh, they were good instructors. Uh, they had reasons, of course, their own reasons for not wanting to fight against Germany. And uh, so I just had those two, luckily, for just that short period that I was at Robert Sides. I converted onto the Hawker Heart. Uh, well, as I said, uh, the most difficult thing about Hawker Heart was to taxi it on the ground. There was no way of steering it except by getting the slipstream over the, over the rudders and over the control surfaces. Now, when 
when the, when you were taxing on an earth surface where the tail skid could easily skid across like tarmac, you could hardly use the motor so uh, to to produce a slipstream so when you taxied from the hangers in those years were lined up the hangers were in line with the old Pretoria Johannesburg uh, uh, main road they were just off that and uh, used to taxi from downhill from the hangers down towards the takeoff point there was no resistance on the tail skid and you had no way of steering it so the pupils used to hang onto the wing tips and you used to tell them to pull one wingtip or push the other one to help your taxi get the aeroplane to the downwind side. But very often uh, the aeroplane ran away because it was slightly downhill and downwind, of course. So the aeroplane ran away from you and you had, uh, you had to, uh, sometimes to stop an accident, you had to switch off and uh, start all over again. If you think back, it, it's amazing how primitive and how we managed to do all these things. The back cockpit of, a, of the Hawker Hart still had, of course, the machine gun ring on. It was a converted bomber. It had the gun for the Lewis gun in the back cockpit. And uh, the, uh, the instructor sat there with a, the most basic instruments. He, all he had was an airspeed indicator and an altimeter. He had a small stick at the back and a rudder uh, which was placed there in event of the pilot being shot when the aircraft was on operation so that the observer could perhaps still in an emergency land the aeroplane. And those were, that was the instructor's office. Uh, I learned a lot about the instructor's office later because once I qualified for my wings uh, at uh, at uh, Roberts Heights, I said we were the first course. It might be interesting to note that there was nothing like a wings parade or so, and nobody took any notice of us at all. We actually went and had our uniforms made. We had to pay for our uniforms, our officers' uniforms. We had them made at. Uh, uh, a tailor, a military tailor in Pretoria who was coining money left uh, uh, hand over fist over that period. We had two uniforms made, a Barathea and another one which was a summer uniform. But as I said, we never got our wings, we never officially were given our ranks or anything. We just, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we put out our ranks and we, we sort of heard we could go on holiday and we went on holiday with ranks but with no wings. A lot of us that came to Cape Town were eventually stopped and arrested on the, on the Cape Town railway station by the military police because it wasn't, uh, you couldn't wear wings without having badges of rank or vice versa. So we were improperly dressed. Yeah. Uh, but eventually it was all sorted out. Uh, but it wasn't like later where people had made a big fuss and pinned wings on your chest and so on. So I had nothing of that. Uh.